Well, you may know this to be true, but about half of Americans will make New Year's resolutions in 2019. About half of them will do so. And about 80% of those resolutions will fail and end by the second week in February. (laughs) So the odds are kind of stacked against us. And whether you've made a formal resolution, official resolution or not, most of us, probably all of us, in fact, have come into the room and come into the new year with a sense that we'd like to see some things different this year, that we have hopes, we have expectations, we have desires that we'd like to see come about in the new year, some changes that we'd like to see take place. And here's what we're going to do the first three weeks of 2019. We're going to talk about this idea, this theme of resolve. I'm not talking about resolutions, but I'm talking about resolve, a resolve of the heart that we're going to give this year to God and that we're going to commit ourselves to certain activities, to certain things that are important to Him. I'm going to talk about core commitments that every believer should have first on their list. And I mean that literally. Everyone in this room who calls themselves a follower of Christ, these are the things that should be most of your concern as you face this new year, core commitments that every believer must have as a part of their life. And it starts with the question. It's a question that you've inherently asked and maybe even answered as you've started the new year. Here it is. What should we commit ourselves to in 2019? What should we commit ourselves to as a church in 2019? And what should we commit ourselves individually to in 2019. And I want to submit to you that many of the resolutions that we make, many of the commitments that we make are secondary matters. They are are issues that really only address symptoms rather than the problems and the challenges that we face in our lives. Doctors will tell you that they spend most of their time treating patients with symptoms rather than the true problem that's going on in their life. They will tell you that people would just kind of exercise a little bit, and if they would eat decently, then a lot of things could be straightened out for them. If you have a leak from the ceiling, water is leaking from the ceiling, that's a symptom. It's a sign, it's a warning sign of something else going on, and to put a bucket under the water only addresses the symptom, not the problem. Here's the whole premise. There are certain things in life that address other things in life. Not all resolutions are of equal value. Not all commitments are of equal value. You can spend a lot of time committing yourself to certain things and yet still live an unproductive and ineffective life. So in life, there are higher pursuits, source matters that impact all the other portions of life. Here's what I believe. From right priorities flows right living. That if we will have the courage and faith to align ourselves and rearrange our life in such a way that we will match God's design, then I believe with all my heart that things have a way, life has a way of just lining up. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, it's recorded Jesus' words when he said to his disciples, I have come that you might have life and have it to the fullest. It is God's desire, it is Jesus' desire that he would be at work in our lives in such a way that we would have an abundant kind of life, a life that is characterized with the quality of eternity, a life even on this side of heaven that would glorify God and that would benefit us. That's what he desires for us. So in this series, we're going to talk about first things first for every believer, pursuits that every believer should put first on their list. And it's going to revolve around really two things. It's going to revolve around, first of all, what is called in the Scripture the Great Commandment. We're going to look at that today, the Great Commandment, and the Great Commission. There's a reason why they're called great, (laughs) because they're really, really important. And so as we unpack these two things from Jesus' mouth, from his lips to us, we're going to come to understand more how to live our lives. So today, the very thing that we're going to talk about is first things first. What is the very first thing on the top of that list? And I'm going to challenge all of us that in 2019, that we will learn and we will grow, we will develop to love God more and to put God more first in our lives. Here's the great commandments recorded in Matthew chapter 22. And if you remember the context, you'll know that there was this religious leader, this rich young ruler who came to Jesus and asked Jesus, teacher, what is the greatest commandment of them all? Bottom line it for me. What is the greatest one of them all? And after some back and forth, here's what Jesus said. He said to him, Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, 
with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Doesn't get any more clear than that. Doesn't get any more bottom line than that. This is the first thing. It's the first priority of life. This is the source matter from which all of life should flow. But here's the problem. We drift. We forget. Life gets busy. We become stressed out. We become preoccupied. Let me illustrate that with what I call my undeniable laws of life. Now, these apply to me, and maybe they apply to you also. Mike's undeniable laws of life. (laughs) Here's some truisms for, for life that I found to be true for me. Here's the first one, law number one, the law of perpetual projects. The idea here is that there's always something else to do. You know, there's, there's never a time when, you know, now we may sit back and relax, but there's a, never a time when we don't have something that can be done that needs to be done. The law of perpetual projects. Here's the second one, the law of competing choices. All those things that need to be done compete with each other. And the competition, the rivalry, is not often between what is good versus bad. That'd be an easy decision to make. Often, and this is how it gets complex, it's between what is good versus what is good or what is good versus what is better or best. And life becomes very complex because we're trying to figure out what to do because all these choices are competing with one another. Here's the third thing. Law number three is the law of the squeaky wheel. Out of all these things and all these choices that need to be done, you know what tends to get done. The thing that squeaks the most. Or the kid that squeaks the most. (laughs) If you're a parent, right? The squeaky wheel gets the grease. And so we tend to live life, and it's been called this, under the tyranny of the urgent. That's where the urgent things in our life rule our lives. And I want to remind you that just because something is urgent does not mean it's important. And just because you're busy doesn't mean that you're being productive. Activity does not equal productivity. So we've got to be careful not just to do things, but to do the right things. Let me illustrate it another way. There was a guy many years ago, you probably read one of his books, Stephen Covey. He was an author. He came up with a matrix that illustrates time management in our lives. And he talked about the fact that there are four quadrants of life that we tend to live life out of. And they're on a scale, they're on a spectrum between low and high in matters of importance, what is not important compared to what is really important, and what is urgent, what is Low on the urgency scale and what is high on the urgency scale. He brought these things together. He talked about how we live life in this tension and what it means. So in quadrant one, many people tend to live life in the important and in the urgent. Important and urgent. So at first glance, we say, well, yeah, that makes sense. But he's saying, no, this is not the place to really live life from because, yes, you may be doing things that are important, but you're doing them urgently and you're doing them hastily. This is, this is life lived in a reactive fashion, not in a proactive fashion. This is doing the things that are important, but not doing them most of the time, not doing them very well. This is crisis mode living. And this is a stress-filled kind of life because they are important, but they're urgent. And they've got to get done. It's emergency kind of living. Same thing is true here. Quadrant two is where we live life out of the urgent but not important. And this is a life lived with interruptions and with distractions. Where it's urgent, it's right in front of me, therefore it gets my attention, but it's not really important. So it doesn't really translate into anything of value in my life, but I have to do it because it's urgent. He said, don't live life in quadrant two. Quadrant three is the not urgent and the not important. Now, this is where we'd love to spend a lot more time, right? <laughs> this is the time-wasting quadrant. This is where we're doing things that aren't urgent, but also doing things that aren't really all that important. This is where we pursue the trivial, things that don't matter. So you really shouldn't live a lot of your life in that quadrant. Here's the fourth quadrant, the important but not urgent. And you put an asterisk by that one. Because Covey says that's where we need to make sure that we live life from, at least part of life. A good portion of life should be lived in this, in this 
area of doing the things that are important and valuable, that, are, that mean something to us, but not doing them hastily and not doing them in an urgent fashion. This is quality time. This is relationship building. And a portion of life should be lived from this place. Now, the reason that we bring this up, again, is because this whole spectrum of that which is important compared to that which is urgent, we want to think in the, in the, in the matter of proactivity, where we tell life what to do rather than to be a victim of life. We become victims of life. The ideal here is that God has given us purpose and intention, and by our courageous and faithful choices, we can live life a certain way where we direct life rather than it direct us. So here's the big question associated with this. Where do you tend to live your life? And how's that going? We want to make sure that we end our lives having done the most important things. Here's what I want to say to you. Now is the time to do that. Now is the time. This is the year for you. There is such a great opportunity before you, an opportunity to change, an opportunity to see different things for your life and for your family. And it holds uh, before you in the choices that you make, the choice that you would even make today about what kind of year that you have before you. God has a plan. God has desires for you and me. And if we will make courageous choices, we could see those things come about. Because we want to make sure that we end life having lived our values. And now is the time to do that. Because this is true. The most courageous thing a person can do is to live their life according to their values. There's a difference between a proclaimed value and a practiced value. A proclaimed value is what we say is important to us, what we say we hold dear. A practice value is what we actually do. And I would submit to you that a value that's just proclaimed and never practiced is not really a value after all. It's not really all that important if it's never, ever done. Again, the premise is first things first. Everything seems to fall into place when first things are first. In fact, that's more than a rule to live by. Listen, it's a promise from God. You say, where? (laughs) Here it is, Matthew chapter 6. Now, remember the context here. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, is talking about worry and anxiety and stress. And he says in that context, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Everything else that you need for life will be added unto you. What an amazing, amazing promise. So my plea for us this year is that we will seek first the kingdom of God in our lives. That we will put Jesus first. We will put first things first. That we will have faith in God. That we will walk in trust in Him. And that every one of us in this room will see that He will provide all other things needed for us. It's a promise. So, 2019 is the year to depend on Christ. We're seeking to make this the year that we as a church depend on Christ. Will you seek to make it the year that you depend upon Christ? If you look at the resolutions that people make in the new year, they can be categorized really into two categories. One has to do with our time. The other has to do with money. I mean, look at the list of the top resolutions that people make. You can actually put them into these categories, time and money. Why is that? Because time and money are the primary assets of our life. We know this to be true. The quality of our lives is determined and depends upon what we spend our time on and what we spend our money on. So these are really important issues. The good news is that God's Word addresses these. And we can, this year, put God first in our time and put God first in our money. Let's talk about that for a second. Now you have to figure this out for yourself, right? How does this apply to you? But let me throw out some suggestions in our time. This could be the year that you spend daily time in prayer that you give God the first part of your day, that you put Him first, not last. He's not an afterthought. He's not a leftover. You put Him first in your day. That, that you give a portion of your day 
Begin your day with some time in prayer and reading God's word in some way that you spend time building your personal relationship with him in that way. That could, this could be the year that that occurs. This could be the year that you reap the benefits of faithful worship attendance. Folks, there's a trend that's going on with Christians in America. The trend is if I attend once, maybe twice a month, I'm getting my fill of worship. That's, that's sad. It's tragic. You need to be here. We need each other. And by the way, let me just say this. Is it as great as a, a, our tool for live streaming and our online presence is, it's a great tool for people who are traveling, who are sick. It, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. But I want to remind you, there's no such thing as the virtual church. There's no such thing as the online church. God created the body. We need each other, and we need a physical presence with each other because we experience things in this room, and we sense things in this room that you just don't sense online. And so this thing that is a great tool should never be a crutch, or worse yet, an excuse not to be with the body of Christ. This could be the year that worship really becomes a regular part of your spiritual growth. This could be the year that you experience the joy of serving. Ashley mentioned, we need you. We do. We need you. We need people. There's a lot of great things to be done here in our church. This could be the year that you give some portion of your time in service to something outside of you towards someone or something else. This could be the year that you really, really prioritize your marriage and your family. The things that compete against your marriage, you... you, you uh, defend yourself against those things. You make your marriage, you make your family a priority. These are key priorities, okay? These are key decisions that we make. But I also want to remind you that there's something more than that when it comes to including God in your time and making Him first in your time. What I mean by that is there's a way of living life in which we can invite God into all dimensions of our life, all aspects of our life, that God is a thread that runs through the fabric of every dimension of our life, and that we have this kind of streaming God consciousness and this God awareness that He is with us in the ups and downs and the goods and the bads of our life, that He is there and He's a part of every, every dimension of our life. That's putting God first in our time as well. This could be the year that that occurs for you. What about in our money? This is so important also. Because why? Because this seems to be a source of great anxiety and stress and preoccupation for so many people. This could be the year that that monster of money comes under the, the leadership and the lordship of Jesus Christ. This could be the year. This could be the year that you develop the discipline of 10, 10, 80 living. 10% given to the Lord. 10% saved or put into retirement. And then 80% spent on the rest. Remember, first things first, that there are principles in God's word for financial freedom for you, where this can become a, a source of peace for you a, 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 rather than a source of worry for you the cloud of debt that some of you are living under, this thing that's constantly hanging over your head, this could be the year. You sit down at your kitchen table with your spouse and you join hands and you pray and you say, together by God's strength, we're going to conquer this thing that rules and reigns in our life. This could be the year that that occurs. And by the way, I want to, t I want to say to you that there's this class that we're, we're offering to be equipped in this. Many of us were raised in homes where we didn't learn principles of financial management from our family. <laughs> it's not the best place to learn them. And so we, we grew up kind of crippled in this, where we're offering a course here to equip you and empower you for this to be a source of freedom for you. It's Financial Peace University. It begins in a couple of weeks. It's going to be a wonderful, wonderful class. It's eight weeks long. I would encourage you, if you've never been taught these biblical principles, to take part in something like this. So this could be the year for that. Let me also say, this could be the year that you give first to the Lord. This is very practical. There's a practical element to this here. I believe in this place. Not just because I'm a pastor. I believe in this place. It's one of the reasons why we as a family leverage our resources to it because there are ministry that are, that are taking place, ministry that impacts the eternities of people. Literally, the eternities of people are impacted through the ministries of our church. 
We're doing missions both locally in our community that is impacting people. We're doing missions that's impacting people around the globe. There are members of our church who are going through difficult financial times. Every month, we are helping a member of our church in some way, giving them some financial assistance so that they can get through this tough period of life that they're going through. It is through our gifts and our generosity that we're able to help the real lives of people. And let me remind you, as much as good that's happening for others, you are benefiting, you are being blessed by the ministry of the Brook Church. I know that because you're here. I mean, you are worshiping, you're experiencing spiritual growth, you're being taught God's word, you're making lifelong friends, you're being loved, you're being accepted, you're being encouraged. Your children are learning and growing. They're being taught God's word, they're being molded and shaped by the word of God. So practically, you giving to, you supporting the place where these things are occurring for you and for your family is just important to do. It's just the right thing to do. Lest you become what typifies so many. Lest you become a consumer. Taking and receiving rather than being a contributor. Here's the important thing, and I imagine this is true in our church because it's true in every church, and I don't know what people give. Unless you're aspiring for leadership, I don't look at that. I don't want to know that kind of stuff. But there are people, I'm sure there are, who have the means and the resources by which to give and are benefiting from the ministry of this church who don't support it. I'm sure that's true. And I would just say to you that that's selfish. It's just selfish. And you need to learn to give to your church that is blessing you and your family. It's just a fact of life. And here's the important thing. Here's really the most important thing. And if you got the other but didn't get this, I'm, I'm sorry for it because this is most important. I mean this with all my heart because the Lord is going to take care of his church. He's been taking care of it for 2,000 years. He's going, to go, he's going to do okay, okay? So whether you give and contribute or whether you withhold for some reason and consume, what God seeks to do more than anything else is to teach you that you can trust him in this area of your life. more than anything else. This area of life that preoccupies you, creates worry, you can trust Him. And if you do, there are so many practical blessings and so many spiritual blessings that come our way. If you will have the courage and faith to arrange and rearrange your financial life in a way with the way that God designed, then you're on a new path You're on a path to freedom, you're on a path to life, and you're on a path to impacting others with all that God has blessed you with. And there'll be no regrets at the end of life when you do that. So, God wants to do something for you, not get something from you. This is all about you and you being blessed. And this could be the year that that takes place because here's what's true. Here's what's true. Faith left undone is practical atheism. Now, we would never say, I don't believe in God, but we would act like it. Why? Because faith doesn't just sit and soak and sour. Faith does. Faith acts. Faith must be put into practice in order for it to be faith at all. So there remains for you and me two questions for 2019. Two questions. I hope that you'll you'll ask these honestly to yourself, seek to answer them honestly. Do you trust God? Do we do we trust God? Do you? Do you really? And if you don't trust God in the area of your life, it's okay. He can handle that. Admit that, own that. Start there. That's the starting point. Do you trust God? But if you do, if you say, I trust God, I trust His promises, I trust His word, here's the second question that we have to ask and answer. Will you act like it? 
Will you act like it this year? Will you activate and actualize your faith by putting it into practice in some very practical, practical way? And maybe it could be in one of these areas that I mentioned today. Again, folks, we have such a great opportunity before us in 2019. There's a future before us, lots of things that we can see take place. If you keep doing the things, th- same things you've always done, you'll keep getting the same results. You have the courage and faith to do different things. Guess what? It's highly likely you're going to see different results. Will you? Let's bow in prayer. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I just want to ask you to consider those questions today. Do you trust God? And will you act like it? I want to remind you that the great commandment that we started with today, from the lips of Jesus, were you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And I want to remind us all that all this that I've talked about today begins and ends with love. To grow deeper in love with Christ. To experience His love. To love Him and allow Him to love us. That's His desire. And just think about the fact, if, if God was willing to give His only Son to die on the cross for our sins, willing to send Him from heaven to earth, from eternity to here, to suffer, to die, for our sake. Don't you think the God who would do that would also provide every other need that you have? Of course He would. Apostle Paul said in Romans 8, He who did not spare His Son how will He not also, along with Him, willingly give us all things? He will. So your faith can skyrocket this year, but it's going to be contingent upon your trust to act in faith. Not just talk about faith, but to act in faith. To give give God your time, your, your money, your marriage, your kids, your job, your friendships, to put Him first in these very real areas of life. And His promise is, if we will seek first His kingdom, His righteousness, all these other things will be added unto us. He will be faithful. So Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for this morning. Thank You for the Reminder as we start this new year. A year that's filled with hope and future and brightness, God. And optimism because of the Lord Jesus who seeks to rule and reign in our hearts and by doing so, bless us and benefit us in so many ways. The the one who died for us is the one that said that He has come that we might have life and have it to the fullest. So bring to us the abundance of living, the fullness of life. Do so through your Son. Thank you for our dear church. Thank you for these dear people who are here. Bless them this year as they go from this place, as they have conversations, as they consider your word to them, as they think about what it means to put Jesus first. Give them the strength that they need. Give us all the strength that we need to do so. And we will forever praise you for it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.